Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about services designed to support LGBTQ plus community members with guests. Phyllis Harris, Executive Director of the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland. Ellen LaPointe, CEO of Fenway Community Health in Boston, and Imani Rupert Gordon, Executive Director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, headquartered in San Francisco. So we have the entire United States here represented. Thank you all for, for attending. It's, it's great to have you here to, to talk about a really important topic and uh, no time more important than now. Uh, you know, we've all gone through a whole arc of history when it comes to LGBTQ um, rights, recognition, and, and so on. Um, and we still have a long way to go. So let's, let's just sort of check in and, and talk about how you see um, the, the state of affairs in your regions and, and in the country. So uh, let's talk, uh, let's start off with you, Phyllis, um, uh, okay. over in uh, Greater Cleveland. And so um, thank you for having me. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to give my thoughts and hang out with these amazing individuals on this panel. Um, well, you know, for us, you know, uh, we talked a little bit before, this is not our, our first sort of um, epidemic pandemic. This is a pandemic, but certainly the LGBTQ community has been through some things in our history mm -hmm. around getting recognized and support that we need. And so um, when we learned of, began to uh, learn of COVID and then realized that it was going to have the impact, that it could potentially have the impact that we're seeing, um, um, I called back to the days of, you know, um, being activists and acting up mm -hmm. and um, ensuring that um, all of those in our region who were rallying to to um, to give support, to think about strategic direction and uh, a smart and sustainable way to to support us through something that was unprecedented. Um, to not forget the LGBTQ community. Um, we are those who would um, be most vulnerable uh, um, for some of the negative impacts of um, coronavirus, of COVID, um, left out, challenged housing, jobs, access to healthcare, all of the things. And so really what happened for us, I believe in our, our region is that um, we remembered who we are and um, mm -hmm. began to speak up and um, take to the streets and say, you know, not forget, don't forget us. Um, this is important. Um, we have elders, we have young people, you know, and people in between who are gonna need um, to be thought of as we are preparing ourselves to, to live with this um, pandemic. And demanding to be heard is such, is such an important part. It's not rioting. It's right. not destruction. It no. doesn't threaten America. It's as, as American as anything to stand up and demand to be heard. And then to use, action. exactly, use the, the reference points of, of the past pandemic um, mm -hmm. of, of, of HIV AIDS, and um, which, which still affects us all, and mm -hmm. ensuring that we counter disinformation uh, Ellen, how are you confronting these kinds of, of issues? You have a long history over at Fenway. Um, yeah. How are you confronting th this um, in a way that uh, corrects uh, impressions, uh, gets good information out there, mm -hmm. helps people navigate? Thank you. So, and again, thank you for inviting me to join this group. I'm really delighted to be here. So Fenway Health is uh, many things, actually. It's a federally qualified health center. We serve over 33,000 patients every year, uh, well over half of whom identify as LGBTQ. Uh, we also have a major research institute, which does um, population health and, and HIV research. Uh, and we do a lot of education and policy work that sort of stems from all of this. Um, and we have a number of public health programs that are designed to meet folks kind of where they are in terms of the whole host of challenges that they're confronting uh, in trying to live the lives that we all deserve to live, basically. So when COVID hit in particular, of course, what we uh, intuited and knew immediately was that it was going to be very important to um, uh, center the fact that uh, LGBTQ people um, and people in BIPOC communities are going to be disproportionately impacted anytime there's something like this happening. And that has been the case. Part of the push for uh, Fenway 
Health actually, interestingly, has been to try to make sure that data is collected. So we've been doing a lot of advocacy work to make sure that, um, or to try to get uh, public health departments locally, statewide, and even on a national level at the CDC level to try to capture sexual orientation and gender identity information about people who are testing positive for COVID so that we can know uh, how, um, how it's impacting our communities. Um, so that kind of uh, kind of advocacy work uh, on the background, if I can say it that way, has I think very significant implications for our long-term ability to understand uh, what pandemics and other social uh, uh, challenges um, sort of mean for our community specifically. At Family Health, we had to pivot rapidly, uh, you know, not surprisingly to um, provide as much as we could, as quickly as we could via telehealth. Um, that of course posed a huge challenge to our organization. We also had to, we have well over 600 employees had to move nearly three quarters to remote work situations and try to make sense of all that really quickly. I would just offer that that was actually uh, kind of a remarkable thing to do uh, and experience because what we learned is that we can do it and we can make rapid substantial changes very quickly when we need to and continue to serve our patients and community. Um, the the uh, perhaps unintended benefit of this has been that, you know, telehealth is a very powerful tool actually that we now have at our disposal um, that we continue, we intend to continue to kind of integrate into our regular care and services. Not everybody has access to telehealth services. This is an issue that we will confront in terms of our advocacy and, and policy kind of efforts as well. But to the degree that folks have that as an option, we, for example, we're now able to uh, work with patients in 20 states. That wasn't possible before COVID because we didn't have the freedom to uh, operate um, telehealth uh, programs um, and get reimbursed for them, which is, you know, part of how we stay in business. So, you know, we're looking um, uh, at both opportunities and challenges in this context. We are involved, as it turns out, in terms of the past, you know, we've done, we're part of the HIV Vaccine uh, Prevention Network and the HIV, um, I'm sorry, the HIV Prevention Network and the HIV Vaccine Network. That was all created in the time of uh, sort of the 80s and 90s. That is exactly what's being repurposed right now to do COVID vaccine research. So um, Fenway Health is a part of the vaccine studies that are underway right now. And um, one of the things that I think is so fascinating here yeah. is that, and Phyllis mentioned it, you're mentioning it as well, um, Ellen, is that um, in earlier eras, there was a separation uh, because of fear, because of misunderstandings, because of discrimination, discriminatory uh, practice. There was a separation between uh, different organizations that are natural partners. And what we're seeing is not a, a perfect world, but a world in which you can, you can collaborate and you can take the expertise that was developed, that unique expertise that was developed through the HIV uh, mm -hmm. period or the rights period, and you can share that with others. The development of vaccines is, is another area. And Amani, you're running an organization that has this sort of national footprint and you're creating allies and you're collaborating and you're, you're movement building. Talk about how you see this era right now from your perspective on a national level. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Ladies, it's always a pleasure to be in the same, in the same room as you. So. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Imani Rupert Gordon. I'm the executive director for the National Center for Re Lesbian Rights. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, and, you know, this has been uh, a very interesting uh, time for us. You know, um, I think that it's really important to name that we've come a very long way in the LGBTQ uh, uh, movement, and we still have a very long way to go. And I think COVID has really highlighted that. You know, when um, NPLR was started as a way to be inclusive and, and a way to be intersectional because the needs of women and lesbians in particular were not being met by the larger LGBTQ community. And so uh, NPLR was created to fill a gap. And what our work has been doing since then has been to, um, has been to find holes in the community and find ways that we can bring more folks with us. And COVID has really highlighted just excuse me, just how many holes there are. Because what we see is that, um, is that everyone is affected by, uh, by COVID, but we see that uh, Latinx communities are much more likely to be testing positive and black communities are more likely to die from COVID-related illnesses. And so these are things that we have to think about when we look at 
intersectional issues. You know, it's not enough to just look at LGBTQ communities separately, because for those of those folks that have multiple marginalized or underrepresented um, identities, we know that these are that that it's more than just that we have to consider everything here. Um, and we also know, you know, um, similar uh, to to Ellen, some work that we've been doing at NCLR has been some advocacy to get numbers to figure out how COVID is related, uh, how it is affecting um, LGBTQ people. We know that it's disproportionately impacting people of color. We know that anytime um, there's anything that can be, that can negatively affect anyone, that folks of color, that LGBTQ folks, that low income folks are more likely to be um, overrepresented negatively here. And so one of the things that we've been doing is some advocacy to start collecting data in our state of California. And that's been something that's really important because there's only a handful of states are, um, you know, we're, we're just starting now. There's only a handful of states that are collecting this data right now. So we can only know how this is going to affect our communities. And I think that's really important because as it was said before, this is not our first pandemic. And it took us a very long time to start collecting all the needed data so that we could actually, so that we could um, respond to folks that were, um, that were being diagnosed with HIV and AIDS. And the fact that it took so long and the stigma that was attached to it is one of the, is one of the ways, the barriers to having us get to zero today, that's even still today. Um, our lack of leadership, um, um, our, our, uh, our leadership coming so late to the game uh, to handle these pandemics has something that's been really, really difficult. And that's something that we see repeating. And I think that's really important to name because like everyone has said, this is not our first pandemic. There are things that we could be doing differently that haven't been done. And so we wanna make sure that we are um, out there advocating for the things that we know that we know matters and we know the data informs policy and policy informs funding. And when we're not collecting our data, then we will not have the tools to take care of our community um, now or in the future. The, the, the similarities between that era and now are, are pretty striking um, from where I stand as, as a, a, a white uh, cisgendered uh, uh, male. Um, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, well, back then there was a lot of disinformation there was a lot of demonization of people mm -hmm. who were trying to protect themselves or treating others. Mm -hmm. um, there was uh, a lot of, of talk about um, uh, how marginali marginalized groups kind of deserved what they got. Um, there was uh, a lack of concerted effort to, um, to attack the virus on a research level. Um, and a lack of coordination uh, on a national basis where you had uh, centers of expertise trying to, uh, to fight even within the government um, and fighting against their own uh, administration. At that point, it was the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of this uh, go on. Um, how is, is, are your communities, your organizations responding to that side in a way that helps the people who you're trying to, um, to, uh, to, whose interests you're trying to advance. Um, are, are, you, are, are you finding a, a more sophisticated platform, Phyllis, as you're, as you're trying to uh, deal with uh, the situation over in Ohio, where, you know, it's an election year, so Ohio is going to be the center of a lot of attention, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you know, like, we are really focused at the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland of the uh, on serving the individuals in the best way possible. And so I understand the, 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 politi the politics around this. Um, I'm, I'm, I can't say that I understand it. I see <laughs> and um, experience um, the politics around this and, and see the parallels that you are, that you pointed out um, and you know, can say, here, here we are again in, in a situation where those of us who are most vulnerable are in some ways under attack, right? And I would use that strong language in that um, even even the the fact that early on, you know, there was this sort of like, okay, you know, if it's impacting older people, you know, that's fine. Um, you want to sacrifice that older people for your <laughs> for your grandchildren. And I was just like, what is this? You know, like who are we? Uh, how how who gets to place value on who gets sacrificed? Uh, you are know, and then, with disabilities. Yes, people with disabilities right. and um, devaluing, so, uh, devaluing an individual because of, of some judgment that that and as of course yeah. it's never me 
right? The whole line around um, essential workers, you know, and who they are and, you know, and Mm -hmm. so we all know, you know, what's going on in in terms of that. Um, So um, it feels huge, right? It feels like business as usual in some ways. And so um, our response to that has to has been to listen to individuals who are impacted um, and to to um, you know pivot our, our services so that we can best serve them um, and that and and that is our focus and so you know that meant you know um, our seniors couldn't come to the center Monday Wednesday and Friday for their socialization for their for their um, meals you know that they mm-hmm. enjoy together um, for the exercise you know and the yoga and um, um, but we had to figure out what to do so um, we you know, pivoted, we got onto these virtual platforms, we learned how to use them very quickly, down and dirty, you know, like, um, um, we listened to our elders, they're they're like, after the stay at home order, they're like, we we need to come back. Um, And so we figured out how to make that happen. Uh, So while they don't eat together now, um, Mm -hmm. they do come to the center in smaller groups, and they get to take their lunch home with them. So we know they're being fed. So there's so much that we've done to really focus on the individuals who are directly impacted the, in the best way possible as a community center here in, mm-hmm. here in Cleveland. And we just took a, took a poll and, and the, the results of the poll are quite interesting. We asked uh, people to answer uh, twice as to what the most important uh, uh, needs are. And the two most important needs were physical and mental health support, mm-hmm. and that includes socialization and all, and all of that, and then support for legal rights. Uh, in other words, to to to, uh, to support people in that way. There were other uh, answers uh, that could be given. The, what was interesting is that jobs received no answer, mm. received no support. There were uh, there were other answers about uh, community connection and and uh, family services and so on and so forth. But it is striking that physical and mental health on the one hand, legal rights on the other, seem to have gotten a lot of focus. Jobs mm-hmm. were not the big issue right now. Uh, given where we are, um, and I find that to be uh, very interesting. Ellen, when when you're talking about uh, adjusting to this time, are you finding that that um, those areas of of uh, physical and mental health is the biggest yes. concern that people have? I know I know that you provide those services, but you also provide yeah. other services as well. Yeah, what I would come, I guess what I would offer is that we really can't know what not naming jobs means in this context. It may just be that folks are not choosing that as top two relative to the LGBTQ community specifically. Right. I'm confident that this is an issue of great concern to many, many of us in our communities and with our family members and loved ones who are struggling. Um, but I think to that point around it so clearly being physical and mental health, we've certainly experienced that. I mean, what, what, the word that hasn't come up yet in this hour is the word trauma. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, trauma is both, uh, you know, COVID has brought us a, a kind of new trauma, but it's also um, awoken and exacerbated existing trauma in our communities. Um, there is fatigue and just this, I don't know, uh, my own my own sense here around and even working with our team is that just the fact that we have to now sort of settle in to a fall season and a foreseeable future of having to live in this way is very challenging for people. The experiences people have in their homes every day. There are people who are in harm's way in their homes, right? We have to remember that. And so we get that. Our, our, our patients call us and they need support. Um, and then, of course, everything that's happened sort of in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder and, 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 and before that, of course, um, but really amplified, I think, by that particular event that happened at the end of March is um, another triggering event that um, has brought great trauma onto our community. So people are really, really handling a lot. And um, that, again, the ability that we have to um, focus some of our care and services into um, a, a sort of a telehealth, sort of an online support network, that has been a really high priority for us. The demand for our behavioral health services has gone through the roof. We are, in, we are experiencing um, unprecedented wait times again for uh, that particular service in our organization. The other thing I'll just say, and I'll stop, is we have to remember, and we try to bring this forward whenever we're kind of engaging. People people need their six-month checkups. They need their screenings. They need their regular health care now. And a lot of that has to happen in person. There's only so much you can do via telehealth. So part of the challenge now is really figuring out how we can try to make our environment 
uh, as safe as possible so folks can come get the services and care they need and so that and that they're hearing from us and really know that they can do so in a way that's um, 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 uh, going to work for everyone. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I find so interesting is that there was earlier on in the pandemic this debate between stopping everything and, and not stopping anything. Right mm -hmm. and now, I think we're all coming together. Whether whether it's red state or blue state or conservative or liberal or or progressive or whatever, we're all coming together where we say, "Look, we at least have to navigate this." Now, there might be different opinions, but we do have to continue navigating because we have to keep living, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right Amani? I mean, you do, you have to you have to keep going. You can't stop advocating. You can't stop providing the services that Ellen pointed to or that, or that Phyllis uh, pointed to. And, and you as a national organization, Imani, you just can't pack it in, right? Right, no, we can't at all. You know, one of the things that I think is a misconception is that um, work stopped for us and it didn't. You know, um, NCLR is, uh, we do a, a lot of work to uh, work to achieve human civil uh, rights. Um, but a big part of what we do is impact litigation, and the courts didn't close. And so that's a really important thing, that, um, that we are still very much doing work. Uh, you know, uh, fortunately, folks are able to work remotely, um, but the courts are still open, and so that's happening. We also uh, do asylum work. Uh, during uh, the pandemic, we've seen that people have uh, won their asylum cases, so um, work is still very, very much happening. Um, and I, I, which, which I think is just really important. And I also wanted to echo what, what Alan said. I think that it's really, um, you know, when we think about the issues that are affecting LGBTQ people, um, it's, often, it's often the same issues that are affecting everyone. And I think an important thing to name is that every issue is an LGBTQ issue. You know, there are things that, that disproportionately impact um, uh, LGBTQ folks. You know, um, LGBTQ young folks are 120% more likely than um, their uh, straight and cis peers uh, to experience homelessness in their, uh, in their lifetime, much more likely to, um, uh, you know, experiencing bullying in school. Um, older adults are more likely to experience discrimination in elder care, care facilities. So there are ways that we are disproportionately and again negatively impacted, but everything affects every, affects folks. And we start thinking about this. It's not an intersectional is, issue. It's actually an issue of multiple jeopardy. People are facing multiple forms of discrimination um, mm -hmm. at every every single turn. And I think that that's something that's really important. So um, thinking about. Uh, 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 being able to afford housing, uh, jobs that pay a living wage, these are all things that are important. And again, just to echo, during COVID, this is much more difficult. You know, we're seeing, you know, Phyllis, you had um, spoken about this, you know, essential workers, not all essential workers are treated or paid essentially. And um, these same folks are often the people that are um, experiencing discrimination in other ways um, and aren't, don't have the same uh, economic power and um, access to resources. And so there are a lot of things um, uh, adding up against the most underrepresented in our community. Of the points you you all are making, the whole idea of of trauma and then um, uh, the the uh, the fact of belonging to uh, to the LGBTQ community or being black or um, or uh, being a Hispanic uh, person of color um, acts as a um, as as almost a multiplier. It has a multiplier effect uh, on this. We asked. Um, another question, uh, where the, uh, the uh, discrepancy in terms of rights and uh, equal treatment uh, is most acutely felt, and we ask people to, to choose uh, two different definitions, and we use different definitions, and the two definitions that seem to um, have attracted the most attention are rural areas, uh, people in rural areas um, having the most discrepant um, experience, and people in the southern parts of the United States um, having the most um, uh, difference. Um, do you, in terms of your own perception of, of the issues that are felt by the community, uh, how do you feel about those two definitions? People living in rural areas, people living in the south. Are those areas where you think that there uh, is more work that's required and are you uh, working in that? I'm gonna give it to Amani first because of your national uh, profile, mm -hmm. Amani. Sure, sure. 
So certainly, when we think about um, when we think about uh, uh, state laws, and like there are definitely um, ways. There's definitely rural areas, parts of the South that just aren't as friendly to LGBTQ folks, and we know that that is we know that that's true. Um, but some of the stuff that we do at NCLR is to have some representation for folks. One of the programs that we have um, that's happening September 21st through the uh, 27th, uh, you can register on our on our website. It's called Rural Pride, and this is something that happens every year in a rural part of the country. And the idea here is to provide provide an access to resources to folks that even pride parades when they come around are still hours away from some folks. We have to remember mm -hmm. that not everyone is, sees themselves represented and is able to find support everywhere. And so um, rural pride is the way it moves from, it moves into different rural parts of the country. This year um, obviously will be virtual. So this is something that will be accessible hopefully to, to more folks. So, um, you know, it's, I think people experience discrimination obviously all over the country, but when it's not, um, uh, you know, I know in California, we get a lot of support. We get a lot of support from uh, elected officials. We get a lot of support. Um, there is sometimes a different culture, um, and we see ourselves represented in different ways. And so um, just finding ways to see yourself represented and uh, to provide more access to resources is something that I think everyone's looking for. Mm -hmm. I'm interested, Phyllis, in, in your take on this, uh, on this situation. You know, when somebody is um, racist or... Um, against people of a, of a different orientation, or um, I don't know, hates men, hates women, uh, hates Jews, hates Muslims, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see uh, that uh, dealing with that? Uh, because uh, are those those people aren't necessarily evil, right? I mean, there is evil out there, but but it doesn't mean that those people are necessarily evil, right? And and there are belief systems that, that tend toward those attitudes. How do you deal with that? Certainly. Well, you know, we, um, you know, part of our mission is uh, around um, education and advocacy. And so education is really important. And sometimes it gets really tough, you know, to go in and, um, you know, uh, this whole, you know, changing the hearts and minds of everyone. And it gets really tough to, to say, like, I, I'm worthy as a Black lesbian feminist, you know, um, who grew up um, in a single family household or whatever. I am worthy of all the rights and respect that anyone else has. I might not have as much privilege, but I'm certainly worthy of the basics and of consideration mm -hmm. and folks being worthy of consideration. So we don't do anything without, you know, um, living into our mission around educating, around advocating, around um, so, um, supporting professionals um, to be better at their jobs because we are going to um, give them information about who we are and how um, um, the decisions that they make within their organizations and how they serve impact our lives, directly impact our lives and, and other people. You know, like um, um, folks have pointed out, we're, we are in all those groups that would be um, seen as individuals who um, have um, been discriminated against or need support. And so my, my response to that, our response to that and, and most is that we're constantly educating people about who we are so that they can, those good people with this misinformation um, about who their friends, neighbors, family members, and coworkers are, um, are able to see us. Um, so somebody mentioned pride events, you know, being visible helps right? Um, um, being um, um, included around um, conversations, around policy, um, around um, what everything that happens helps. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I am, I'm all about it, you know, as a, as a small nonprofit, you know, um, you know, even when we were smaller, um, one of the things that we were building is the opportunity to tell people who we are and educate them. And we really focused on letting them know that you want to be a good professional, let me show you how. You know, um, get to know who we are and um, um, what impacts our, uh, how, the issues that impact our life, and you're going to be great at, at your job. And, you know, it's kind of like a, it helps me to not feel like that I am, you know, you know, begging people to see me and to see mm -hmm. other people who are not, you know, cis and white and wealthy. You know, it's, it's interesting. We just finished another poll, and, and it kind of endorses what you say. Um, we asked what two factors have the strongest impact 
um, broad public embrace of LGBTQ plus uh, equality. And we got two dominant answers, both with 70% respondents saying, uh, on the one hand, laws, so legal protections and regulations. On the other hand, advocacy and education and then popular culture also played a, a very large, large role. In a sense, we need to end up bringing people together on a voluntary basis with a lot of understanding. And that does require listening, talking, advocacy, and even in the, even in uh, Ellen, your and we're gonna we're gonna uh, close out uh, this half hour with you, Ellen. Even in your your ev evolution at Fenway, where you're providing help to a broad uh, array of people, bringing them together, uh, helping to serve the community, that's part of the dialogue as well, right? Sure. I mean, I think one thing I was just reflecting on when I was listening to Phyllis is just. Uh, you know, being mindful that we all have our own work to do. And I think that's true for us as human beings. And I think it's true for us in our institutional settings in our organization. So part of what we're really working to do at Fenway Health is to really build on this very proud legacy we have. It's a nearly 50 year old organization that, you know, came about in the early 70s mm -hmm. through the AIDS crisis. And now here we are to remain relevant to the people that we are here to serve and to do the best work we can. We really need to show up by centering racial equity in everything that we do. We have to really un understand and embrace that there are e racial equity implications to every decision that we make all day long. And, and we need to do that in a way that um, invites people into conversation and doesn't push them out or make them wrong or shame them um, or shame us, each other. You know, this is really critical, transformative, long-term work um, that we need to be doing internally. Um, to remain um, true to the mission that we were founded to sort of serve. And I think that is going to be the centerpiece of our work at Fenway Health. And it is just core to the whole of the story for us in the LGBTQ work that we do in serving everyone who comes to us, not all of them, not every patient, only half of our patients actually identifies LGBTQ. Um, but certainly um, these, are the, these are the things we need to be doing. And I guess to do so in a way that is, you know, invites grace and patience and um, you know, really seeking to create a culture in a sense of uh, belonging and um, um, mutual engagement and support and alignment around shared goals, which I believe we have. Um, when you really get down to it, even people who are maybe disagreeing about what we should do next often agree about where we wanna end up. And we can find that common ground if we slow down, take the time to hear each other and listen. So that's the work I think that we'll be doing internally at Fenway Health for uh, the foreseeable future. Such an important point that you're all making that, that race is of concern to all of us, regardless of our race. Orientation and acceptance is a concern for all of us, regardless of our orientation. Um, embrace, helping us all, helping our friends, helping our families, helping our communities to deal with this trauma is important. And you're all making such a great, great, contribution. It's an honor to have you on. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you all uh, attendees for participating in the polls and for coming to, to uh, visit with us. That's the Nonprofit Report. Mm -hmm.